Welcome everybody to another exciting week with Dr. McDougall and today we are bringing you a topic that you have asked for many times and it is to talk about sugar. There are so many questions and even confusion out there and so uh, we have Dr. McDougall talking about that and we also have questions that you have submitted that I will give priority this time and then of course you can ask questions in the chat and if we have time we'll include them. Uh, I am Gustavo Tolosa and I'm uh, the webinar coordinator for Dr. McDougall and I, it's my pleasure to welcome him every week or almost every week because sometimes we have guests. Dr. McDougall is a traditional medical doctor. I know we have some new people on this webinar so I want to give a little introduction and Dr. McDougall is an internist, a board certified internist. He practices just traditional medicine and for over 40 years and he treats uh, diet related illnesses with with uh, food with diet and but of course whenever needed he will prescribe medications or other medical procedures and uh, he's the author of 11 best-selling books and a new book is coming out next uh, month anyway we could talk about dr. McDougall for hours but uh, we will uh, go ahead and welcome you dr. McDougall thank you for making the time to be here this week how are you oh, it's always fun it's always fun to talk all to you. And always, always fun to answer questions and you know, have new ideas pop into my head. <laughs> right. I, 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 I seem to be lacking on new ideas today, so you'll have to kind of stimulate me. <laughs> okay. But, um, oh, I, I don't know. They, uh, it's an awful lot going on in the world today. It, it is. And, and uh, it all, you almost uh, feel like turning off the TV and closing the newspaper and going out and playing in the backyard. But, uh, yeah, lots going on. It's not surprising a lot's going on in the food uh, business, too. I do think that uh, our side is winning the truth, you know, the good. Uh, I do think the, uh, uh, the people who uh, promote animal foods and oils uh, are losing on many fronts. Uh, they're being exposed, of course, because of the, uh, the cruelty that goes on. Uh, they're also being exposed heavily because of the environmental impact. You know, I've uh, talked to you about how China's recommendations are to eat half as much meat as the Chinese are eating because of the environmental impact. And many European countries, the same thing. They're, uh, they're, they're saying, look, look, let's face it, folks. This is one thing that we can change. We can change the amount of animal foods that we eat. And boy, with all the things going on in the world, like uh, today, the, the terrible forest fires in California and in Louisiana, the terrible flood, floods. I was watching the news last night, which I shouldn't have been doing. And uh, the uh, experts are talking about, well, maybe this could be climate change, even though these two events wouldn't have happened in a hundred and one in a thousand years. You know, you just want to hedge a little bit so that uh well i don't know maybe they can keep their jobs or their respect or something but uh boy uh, you know the events that are going on in the climate are just unprecedented and for anybody to wink a little bit and say this isn't uh important and then to and then to further not make the connection with the uh the food business is is just uh, unforgivable and I don't know how I, I won't I will be alive long enough, probably, but if I ever did live long enough to look my grandchildren in the eye and say, you know, I, I couldn't get the message out. I couldn't get the message out. And they look back at me and they say, but Grandpa, why didn't you try harder to tell people that they have to change the way they eat so they can save our world? Anyway, it, it just it just does get discouraging, but I, I, I will tell you, that I, I know we're winning. It's just that we're not winning fast enough. So get out there and run harder. Right, harder. right. <laughs> well, you are trying, we are trying. I mean, we do these webinars, you do the newsletter, you do lectures, so you definitely are. <laughs> and you know, uh, Gustavo, the really fun thing, and you you, you get some of it uh, on the show here, and all of our office staff gets it, is the, uh, the reward from helping so many people. Uh, people with uh, terrible ulcerative colitis. We had one lady, it took her four months to get over it. She finally told me last week she was completely over her ulcerative colitis and she was virtually dying. Uh, we have people almost every week write us with uh, severe rheumatoid arthritis. These are uncurable diseases. 
In fact, I'm going to be talking this afternoon for a group at Kaiser, Kaiser Hospital. And I ask, you know, what do you want me to talk about? And uh, you want me to talk about uh, the color picture book and why everybody's sick. And they said, no, you know, we're kind of plant-based oriented. Why don't you try to talk to us about something that we might be surprised about? And I said, well, how about uh, inflammatory arthritis? How about rheumatoid arthritis? And they say, oh, that would surprise us. And I said, well, you know, it just so happens the man who's putting on the, uh, the event, Anthony Lim, Dr. Lim, uh, he's seen uh, half a dozen people with rheumatoid arthritis uh, dramatically improved or completely cured since he's been working with me over a year. So for him, it's no surprise at all. But all the other students in there, they go, you got to be kidding. You can cure inflammatory, psoriatic, rheumatoid, lupus type arthritis with a change in diet. You know, they, they will be doubting. They will be doubting until they see it or they take the, the trouble to read the scientific literature, which is convincing enough that we at least ought to be taking a serious look at this. You know, there are many studies in the best journals that show that by various types of feeding, which would be the vegetarian type feeding, that we are low fat and fasting, uh, bring about dramatic improvements in these people. Of course, you can only fast temporarily. That's the problem with I have fasting is uh, how long can you go without food? You can't. But if you can get on a diet that's clean, which is the kind of diet we teach, and it's usually a diet of uh, rice and sweet potatoes and potatoes and corn and various kinds of fruits and vegetables, that's, that usually does it. Some people even have to be more strict. That's a, that's a clean diet. You may call that a fast, but that's a really good food right. diet. And these people are completely cured. Uh, you know, nothing, gone. And they go back in to see their doctors and the doctors go, oh, that's interesting. I suppose spontaneous remissions do occur. Yes, they do. <laughs> and uh, yeah, but doc, it, it never occurred until I changed my diet. That's okay. Uh, you come back when you have trouble, I'll give you my medicines. It, it's really sad, but uh, we are winning. Uh, you, you, you would think just to kind of give you a, a side note and, and a thought about my past. When I first started in this and you said, uh, 40 years ago, I, I guess that's probably, probably right, about 40 years ago, I started in the food part. I've been in medicine about 50 years, a half a century. But when I first started in uh, uh, talking about things like heart disease being caused by diet and the thought that it would, would be reversible, uh, you know, I was considered a quack. I mean, you didn't even speak that way. Uh, you were uh, ostracized. Uh, no doctor would talk that way. I saw, I actually heard, heard one doctor say such a thing in a, a morning conference that maybe that artery disease was reversible. And that was, uh, it's probably about 45 years ago. And uh, a hush went over the audience. And even these days, if you talk about uh, somebody being uh, benefited or cured of cancer, even though the American Cancer Society says diet is a fundamental treatment in various kinds of cancers. That's their pro proclamation February of 2015. Uh, doctors are so backwards uh, that, and, and they're so um, defensive. You know, the emperor has no clothes that if you threaten them, and I, I know there are some exceptions out there, but the exceptions out there that are listening to me, you know exactly what I'm saying because you're afraid to say something too. Uh, doctors are so threatened by their colleagues uh, doing the wrong thing that they're, they won't speak up for the patient. There you have patients that are 100% cured of rheumatoid arthritis, 100% cured of ulcerative colitis, patients that are benefited dramatically from cancer, uh, proven scientific papers, and they're afraid to say something. But I don't know how we got on that track. We were going for sugar, weren't we? <laughs> we were, yes. And I was about to uh, politely interrupt you because it's my job today to keep you on track. <laughs> Uh, Dr. McDougall, uh, please tell us, when you say sugar, most people picture white table sugar or brown sugar or perhaps maple yeah, syrup. Yeah. Can you talk to us about what you mean when you say sugar? Is, is, it, is it the real problem out there for obesity and diabetes? Well, well, sugar, sugar is, uh, when I think of sugar, in fact, I often bring the audience around to start thinking like I do in terms of sugar. Uh, I start calling, uh, you know, rice sugar, 
and uh, wheat and potatoes. Uh, these are these are sugar calories, and they really are. They don't think of them as sugar. As soon as they say that, of course, the white form comes into their mind. But these are sugars. They are rings of carbon with hydrogens attached to them. These sugars are. They're ring structures. And then these rings are attached to other rings and so on, and they make uh, poly sugars. And these poly sugars, we call them uh, starch, amylose, amylopectin, names like that. Uh, you probably think of them as uh, complex sugars, which are uh, rings of sugar, rings of carbon uh, that are in long chains. And so you call them complex sugars. And when you only have a couple of rings of uh, carbon together, we would call them or one ring, you would call them simple sugars, or maybe even four or five or six rings. Uh, together, we call them simple sugars. And of course, simple sugars are the ones we think about in terms of white sugar. Simple sugars do occur in nature. They can occur in uh, sweet things like fruits and fruit juices. And complex sugars taste less sweet. And uh, they come in long chains, thousands of uh, these uh, chains of, uh, of uh, rings. And they do taste sweet too. I mean, a potato tastes sweet. A sweet potato tastes sweet. Rice has a sweet taste to it. It's just not as intense as when you have the simple sugars. Uh, most of the time when you're talking about uh, complex uh, uh, rings, long rings, complex sugars, what you're, uh, you're talking about are things that you don't uh, necessarily associate with uh, sugar. They're kind of staple foods. In fact, we used to have a word for them, which was called starch. Scientific name is amylose or amylopectin if they're branching chains. And uh, these were the basic foods of people throughout all of human history. You've heard me say this uh, ad nauseum. You're so sick and tired of hearing me say this, is that all large successful populations of people throughout all of verifiable human history obtained the bulk of their calories from starch. All large civilized athletic competing, battle fighting, <laughs> baby breeding, <laughs> large, intelligent, civilized populations of people throughout all verifiable human history had lived on uh, starch. Like for example, in China it would be rice and sweet potatoes and buckwheat. And in the Middle East, it would be barley and wheat. In uh, Central America, it would be corn. In the Americas would be corn. Potatoes would be common for people in South America. So those are the, uh, the, the long chains of sugar. Those are starch. And uh, then your short chains of sugar would be, you would think of things like maple syrup and, and uh, <clears throat> honey, and uh, they would be the natural things. And, and also you would uh, think of the refined sugars, such as, such as uh, sucrose glucose, those type of things. Now, I think that the, the real thing that we need to get at right now is how bad are sugars? What, what happened was in the uh, 1970s, and I just happened, somebody sent me a paper on this, and I've, I've actually had this paper many times before. It was published in uh, 19, excuse me, 1997 in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. It was uh, metabolic and behavioral effects of high sucrose diet during weight loss and uh, if you want to see the paper, it's, it's not uh, copyrighted, so you can go right to the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition and get it, this particular paper. Uh, it's interesting. I have uh, more interesting papers on sugar, but it, it brings out some interesting points. Is uh, They talked about how about 20 years ago, people were all upset about being obese, and they blamed being obese on eating fat. In other words, as wild as it may seem, the fat you eat is the fat you wear, okay? So what they just, I mean, what a tough notion to, to come up with. So what they decided to do was they decided to make low-fat foods. And they made low-fat foods, uh, uh, all kinds of cookies and uh, cakes and, and uh, these very high-sugar foods. Can you remember any of them? Snack wells, that's it. Yeah, that's that's right. Right. there they are. Thanks. Uh, so they, what they did is they um, 
they just add the cookies to their roast beef sandwiches. Right. <laughs> and people just got fatter and fatter and fatter. And of course, they were all simple sugar. And, and uh, so then sugar got a bad name. And it swung over completely the pendulum to where now the low carbers, uh, the people who talk about uh, the dangers of, uh, of foods these days, they completely ignore the fats and the meats. Gary Taubes is an example. Uh, they completely ignore these things and say, instead, it's the sugar that's making them. Robert Lustig, he's, he's, he's the sugar guy. And uh, you'll watch him speak. And by the way, he's got a belly on him. And uh, you'll watch him speak and he will not mention anything about animal foods or oils. When it's obvious, the fat you eat the fat you wear, and all he'll do is drum and drum and drum on the sugar. Well, that's not bad because, you know, sugar in the form that it's served and the quantity it's served is not good. It rots teeth. It adds calories. It raises triglycerides in uh, sensitive people. Uh, it's empty calories. Sugar is empty calories. I mean, you'll get vitamins, minerals, proteins, and so on. So Robert Lustig uh, has done some good. Uh, brought some attention, but he's also diverted the the, uh, the focus where it should be away from eating chickens and cows and pigs and cheeses and fishes and vegetable oils and so on, which is really where the source of, uh, of, of uh, fat is coming from. I picked up this paper just this morning. This was a study where they, oh, they fed a, all let's uh, say about 1500 calories to two groups of uh, overweight women. And uh, they made some of the calories sucrose, simple sugar, table sugar. And they made other calories aspartame and uh, also starch to see what would happen to these people. And they fed them in a metabolic ward and they fed them the exact number of calories, the exact number of protein, carbohydrate, exact number of all the ingredients, except for the fact that the sugars were either sucrose, you know, your simple white sugar, or it was a starch to see whether or not it made any difference in terms of your triglycerides, uh, cholesterol levels, body weight, and even your mood, depression, hunger, your negative mood. And they found no difference at all between feeding starch or simple sugar to people. Uh, indicating, one indication that sugar is not the problem. You gain weight by eating simple sugar. I gave an example in my starch solution book. And I explained to you, you had to eat 135 grams of sugar, I believe it was, a day. And you uh, had to eat it for four months in order to gain a pound of fat. It was almost impossible to take and gain fat by eating sugar. You can't do it. The body has a mechanism for converting carbohydrate, sugar. Remember, carbohydrate, sugar, I'm talking about rice, corn, potatoes, white sugar, et cetera. It does have a mechanism. Uh, uh, it's called de, de novo lipogenesis, the de novo, the new conversion of carbohydrate into fat. Uh, we do have a mechanism, but it's not very efficient. Uh, cows and pigs have very efficient mechanisms for doing that. That's why they're, they're efficient food animals. But people don't. And so uh, <clears throat> when we eat uh, uh, large amounts of sugar, it, not much of it turns into body fat. Most of it is burnt off as fidgety motions, as body heat, because it's too inefficient for the human body to do it. Now, when we take fat, okay, remember I told you sugar was a ring structure? So a five carbon ring structure, very stable. If you're a chemist, you know it's very stable. And uh, to take and turn this ring structure into a chain of carbons takes a lot of work for the body to do. It costs 30% of the calories and the, in the food. It takes 30% of the calories that you just ate to make that conversion from a ring structure to a chain structure. And uh, because that's so efficient, the body doesn't want to do it, doesn't like to do it. When it comes to fat, fat comes into the body already as a chain of carbons in the same form that it's stored. So all it does is it moves the fat from the fork and spoon. It moves these chains of carbon onto your spoon, down your gut, into your belly, through your intestinal wall, 
into your blood and then whoop right into your fat cells. Uh, it does it with a cost of 3% of the calories. And it does it so efficiently that it doesn't even change the chemical structure of the fat. This is one of the interesting things that everybody should know. <clears throat> uh, the two food people do know because this is science that was done 20, 30 years ago. And once you've done it, once you've proven it, once you've shown it, you know, the researchers want to go on to new and more interesting things. But what they showed is that the kind of fat that people eat is represented in their body fat. For example, if you eat trans fats, remember the kind they used to sell, the margarines and the Criscos, the dangerous trans fats. If you eat trans fats, they will go into your body without being rearranged and they'll be stuck into your fat cells so that I can come up to you with a needle and I can shove it in your body fat, suck the fat out, take it to the lab, analyze it, and I'll find your body fat is full of trans fats. If you are a big cold water marine fish eater, in other words, you get a lot of omega-3 fats, same thing, I can just go up there and stick a needle in your thigh or your buttocks or abdomen, suck it out, take it to the lab, analyze it, and you'll be full of omega-3 fats. Uh, <clears throat> dairy's, dairy products have a uh, specific kind of fat. It's uh, got a double bond at the C15, C17 position. And if you're a big uh, animal food eater, particularly dairy eater, I can uh, biopsy your fat and I can tell what you like to eat. So uh, the body moves the fat effortlessly, doesn't even change the physical structure. The fat you eat is the fat you wear. If you want a mantra and you're trying to lose weight, well, I guess it could be the other way. If you uh, want a mantra to roll over in your head every few seconds, just say to yourself, the fat I eat is the fat I wear. It's just so simple. It just kind of, it's just kind of, uh, uh, it kind of slips off your lips. Slips. The <laughs> fat I eat is the fat I that's wear. Right. Yeah, that's what it does. And uh, that's what it does. Where do you think that stuff goes? You know, it goes on your skin and under your under your body. And your skin. Well, anyway, uh, whereas right. sugar is very difficult to convert. Anyway, <clears throat> sugar is the fuel for the body cells. Do you remember about glycolysis? That's the basic energy source of the body, sugar. And fat the body will use for energy under uh, desperation and also during some exercise. It is not the primary form of energy. There are cells in the body which will only burn sugar. You know, this is those of you who say you don't need sugar. I hear people uh, on uh, television shows, you know, some of the gurus, they say, well, you don't need any sugar at all in your body, period. It's absolutely unnecessary. Well, that's not true. Uh, your red blood cells will only burn sugar. There are right. cells of your, your glomeruli of your kidney that will only burn sugar. Your brain primarily burns sugar. It will only burn ketones, products of fat, under desperation. <clears throat> so what if you don't eat any sugar at all? This is what these uh, the gurus say, so to speak, half informed. It's what they will say is they will say, see, you don't need any sugar. Well, if your body doesn't make any sugar, what the body will do is convert protein into sugar, which is called gluconeogenesis to make that sugar for those red blood cells and those kidney cells and even the brain cells. So if it doesn't have it, it's going to make it out of protein. And where's it going to get the protein? It's going to get the protein from your steak or it's going to get the protein from your muscle. So uh, sugar is, uh, is crucial for good health. Right. Now, you don't want to eat it as white sugar. You'd rather eat it as rice and uh, potatoes and so on. Somebody is saying here in a comment that uh, Sugar combined with, with fat as in the form of cookies or cakes or ice cream. Uh -huh. Okay, now that's a different story, right? <laughs> yeah, that's, a do that's a double whammo. Let me, let me tell you why that's a double whammo. Uh, <clears throat> what happens here is uh, when you eat fat and sugar together, you know what we're talking about, mm -hmm. uh, cookies, cakes, right. uh, pies, things like that. They're a mixture of fat and sugar, uh, and it makes both of them more palatable. What happens is the sugar goes in and raises the insulin levels and the insulin stuffs the fat into the fat cells. 
So they work hand in hand to make you even more fattening, whereas one or the other wouldn't have that powerful, uh, as powerful effect. And uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe that's why they go together so well. You see, the human being is a survivor. <clears throat> During most of our history, as human beings, we've been trying to get enough food to make it to the next day and not starve to death. So any advantage that we can get in terms of uh, attaining and storing calories, the human body has adapted toward. But here we're in a society and you can't look any place. Every place you look, all you see is obesity. You know, except for the Olympics. Except the Olympics. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, I, I can't see it. And then, of course, you look in the crowds, they're the fat people. But it's... it's uh, I would say it's not even shocking anymore, but it's, it still is shocking to me. And I don't know whether there are fat people out there, and I know there's you people out here who are listening to us who are still overweight, whether you become numb and insensitive to it yourselves, but I haven't. You know, I've been, I've been around on planet Earth almost 70 years, and I have not gotten used to looking at obese people and uh, having a comfortable feeling about it. And I don't want you to misinterpret that and say, well, I, I'm a fat hater. It just doesn't seem right to me. You know, it would be like, it would be see, look, look at like a, looking at a hippopotamus and finding him the size of an alley cat. Alley cat. You know, or looking at, a, looking at a rat and finding him the size of an elephant. It just wouldn't seem right. And it's the same thing when I look at people. It just doesn't seem right. Dr. Mantodo, what about uh, fruit? Since, um, you know, some, some people, after having lunch or dinner, they crave something sweet. What would you suggest that they could do to calm that <laughs> desire to have something sweet? <clears throat> well, your, your body, all the way through its meal, craves sweet. So you have the sweet tasting taste buds on the tip of the tongue. Uh, you're, you're a sugar seeker. And if you seek sugar throughout a meal and you don't get it, uh, then you end up in the meal very deprived. Uh, if you eat sugar throughout your meal, like pasta, potatoes, and sweet potatoes, then you get to the end of the meal, you have a tremendous amount of satiation. Say you don't eat sugar during your meal. Say all you eat is cheese and pork chops and... and uh, oil and fats. So you, so you have no, no sugar at all uh, the whole meal. And you're eating and eating and you're not getting any satisfaction because it's sugar. It's sugar. We know this from scientific studies where we take, we feed people various meals with different contents of carbohydrate sugar in them. And we ask them to rate how they feel. You know, how satisfied do you feel? And on rating scales, what we find is that fat offers no satiety. Protein offers some satiety, but it's carbohydrate sugar that offers satiety. So if, uh, uh, if somebody eats meals like typical Americans do, they eat all through their meal, they eat very low sugar, no sugar foods. They get at the end of the meal and they say, I'm still hungry. I'm still hungry. Even though my belly is as big as can be and it hurts, I'm still hungry. If I had room for one more pork chop, I'd shove it down because I'm still hungry because they haven't eaten. They haven't eaten the, the, the cues that uh, satisfy the hunger drive in the human being. And so they feel like they haven't eaten. Okay, so th that, that's one reason we have a situation in people where they consider themselves mentally ill. People think they're mentally ill. They, and, and here's how the scenario goes. They say to themselves, <clears throat> there's something wrong with me. I know there's something wrong with me. I just ate three big plates of food and I'm still starving. I must be an obsessive compulsive overeater. Right. Something's wrong. Or they get really, really worried about it and they go to the psychiatrist and the psychiatrist says, you have an eating disorder. You're, You're mentally right. ill. Well, the problem is, is you didn't eat. You see, because what satisfies your hunger drive is carbohydrate. You see, we have these drives. 
Uh, we have all kinds of drives. Some drives we, we would kill for, yet uh, we don't have to satisfy them, like the drive for sex. People kill for the drive for sex, money, position in their company, they kill. But you can do without these. But there are three drives you can't do without. And uh, uh, you will kill for them. <laughs> and they're the drive uh, for breath. breath. Breath is satisfied by oxygen. Oxygen, OK. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and thirst is there. Th I won't play any more trick questions on you. Thirst is, is th thirst is satisfied. You don't say alcohol <laughs> or beer. You say water. And then when I say, what is hunger satisfied by? If you say food, then you're just as wrong as saying air. Hunger is satisfied by carbohydrate. So you've got to get that carbohydrate to get satisfied. So here's the scenario. You're running around hungry all the time because you haven't eaten and you think you're mentally ill. Or the other thing that happens with people <clears throat> is they'll get to the end of the dinner table and there's the calorie bomb. Mm -hmm. You see, they've been starving the whole meal. It's just sitting there, you know, in the shape of a pie or an ice cream dish. And when they eat it, they go, boy, that takes like, that tastes like a calorie bomb. That's a you know that's just overstimulate i just can't believe cuz cuz they haven't had anything to eat all meal and then all of a sudden this concentrated source of calories sitting there this would be like well, i'll give you a couple examples so I'll, you might relate to it if you were ever a cigarette smoker the best cigarette of the day was the one in the morning i mean it was the best cigarette it was probably the only good <laughs> cigarette of the day because you've been deprived for so long and well, think about this. Say you can swim underwater the whole length of the pool. You swim underwater the whole length of the pool, and you get up at the other side of the pool. What's the breath, best breath of the of the swim? Your breath, the best breath. Uh, you, you you want that air so bad, and now you're eating through a meal plate, a meal table, full of protein and fat with none of the reward in it. No sugar in it. No rice. No corn. No potatoes. And you get at the end of the table, and that dessert is irresistible. It is a drug. It is a drug. That's what they say. The way it reacts to me, it's a drug. It's like heroin. Right. Plus, because you set yourself up for this. Well, when people come to our clinic, and by the way, we start one. We'll start one tomorrow. Yeah, we've got about 50 people come to the clinic tomorrow, the 10-day program. Oh, is Dr. Lim going to have fun? Oh. Yeah. Um, and me too. Both, 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 sorry. But uh, these people will come in, and I'll, I'll tell you the way that the, the way they will act. I hope none of them are listening now. But uh, uh, I may watch them, I may not. I've, I've, I've done this for 30 years now. But you watch them come in, and they and they start eating, and they start eating a lot of food. The food is really, as you know, very oh, tasty. Wow. We use some great spices, salt, sugar, and so on. And they love the food, and they sit down, they eat one plate of food, and they, we tell them they can eat as much as they want. They don't have to look around and be ashamed. We encourage them to go up and get a second or third plate of food, whatever they want. So they do. They go up and get one, two, three plates of food. And uh, they keep that up for about three days. And then I'll come up to them, and I'll say to them, uh, what's wrong? Don't you like the food? Well, I love the food. Well, the first day I saw you get three plates. Was it because you didn't think Mary could make two, two, two good dishes, the whole program? So you felt like you ought to get whatever good? And now you find out every meal she makes is fantastic, so that's not the problem. Why aren't you eating three plates of food like you did the first night? And I say, you know, I'm, so, I'm stuffed. <laughs> I'm not stuffed. No, that's the wrong word. I'm not stuffed. I'm satiated. I'm satisfied. You see what they have to do the first three days, they have to build up those carbohydrate stores and get the muscles full of glycogen and the liver full of glycogen. And then, you know, they just pick up a normal sized plate of food. And it, it always happens in every one of them. They finally get control. You see, they're out of control. They're mentally ill, they think. Emotionally disturbed, they think. Uh, it's because they haven't eaten. And then once they get what they're looking for, then uh, everything becomes under control. It'd be like uh, trying to live um, in the hot summer on uh, two glasses of water a day. You go, what's wrong with me? I'm thirsty all the time. 
and I'm always looking for water. I'm water. How do you even drink, do you even drink dirty water? <laughs> and then all, and then all of a sudden, or or, or anyway, yeah. Uh, then all of a sudden, you've got the water, and you're now satisfied, and you're now in control, and now you can get on with looking for food or a job. You know, there's so many of you out there that are starving all the time. And all you're thinking about is food. You can't you're take right. care of yourself. You can't take care of your family. You can't take care of your job. <clears throat> and you're not going to solve this until you satisfy your hunger drive. And what satisfies the hunger drive is sugar. Sugar. <laughs> <laughs> Even white sugar will do it. But uh, the sugar I'm talking about is corn, rice, beans, potatoes. It's uh, starch. Right, right. You must have sugar. It is your food. It is and then, yeah. and then, and then, let me add one other thing. Maybe you sure. want to go on to something else. Is uh, in uh, in a chapter in one of my books, I talk about, or at least a newsletter I wrote one time. It talks about how we add sugar to the surface of the food. Mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of like that Mary Poppins uh, story. Uh, add a little bit of sugar to make the medicine go down. Mm -hmm. Well, we add a little to the, to, a little to the food because we want you to eat the starch. We want you to eat the rice and the potatoes and the sweet potatoes and so on. So we make various sauces and we have you put a little bit of brown sugar on your oatmeal and a little barbecue sauce on your whatever, this or that. They're just made of sugar and salt and spice. There's no oil in them. Because remember, the fat you eat is the fat you wear. Right. So if I, if I can get somebody to eat uh, you know, a plate full of mashed potatoes that big, which, by the way, I did a couple nights ago, and put a little gravy on, which Mary made, uh, without any of the tahini. You know, she just accidentally didn't have tahini one night and found out she didn't need to have the fatty tahini in the brown gravy. Right. So we're making it without the tahini now. So it's just got basically flour and salt and spices in it. Uh, if I can get you to eat that big bowl of mashed potatoes, and I probably can get you to eat it plain or with a little salt on it or with some barbecue sauce on it or ketchup on it, but I know I can get you to eat it with that brown gravy. Mm -hmm. And maybe I did give you a little salt. Maybe I did give you a little sugar. But I fooled you. And I got you to eat the food. Right. And, and there's no fat added to it, right? No fat. And it's, and it's a minor amount of the meal. Compared right. to that big bowl uh, of potatoes, a couple of tablespoons of, of gravy or, or ketchup or, uh, you know, a teaspoon of sugar is 16 calories. Right. You know, I mean, what, what's 16 calories going to do for you with putting a teaspoon of, sh of brown sugar on your cereal in the morning? 16 calories out of the 2,000 you eat a day. Right. And that sugar is not easily converted into fat. So the body doesn't like to do that. Cost right. very costly. We just talked about that. Right. Uh, Dr. Maduro, uh, someone who is a 40-year-old woman says that she's been recently diagnosed with MS. And she says, how does sugar... Uh, how does sugar impact at someone with MS? Uh, and that is not, and I'm not overweight. Should I make any other adjustments on the McDougal plan to stop the advance of MS? No, it has no effect on MS. Uh, okay. It'll rot your teeth. <laughs> it'll, you know, <laughs> sugar rots. Sugar causes bacteria to grow, which produce toxic acids. It'll destroy the enamel of your teeth and give you rotten teeth. It has nothing to do with MS. Uh, MS is caused by consuming uh, mostly animal foods. And uh, we talked about it. We got our, we had our paper published a couple of weeks ago in one of the in, in a journal called uh, Multiple Sclerosis and Related Diseases. I guess a, a very prestigious journal. And they're talking about it. By the way, they're talking about it all over the world, that paper. Uh, we're getting um, uh, side stories from that paper, people uh, putting it in their magazine or in their, their particular publication. And, uh, you know, even though it didn't prove everything forever for everybody, it got the neurologists to open their eyes and see that food is a neurologic patient, which is a complete blind idea to them. I have no idea that anything's important except for except for interferon beta or their other drugs, which by the way, even this food paper should open their eyes and make them uh, put in proper assessment how useless and how harmful and how criminally expensive their drugs are. 
Copaxone, $75,000 a year for the drug. So I think our paper, even though uh, some people may step back and say, well, it wasn't everything you wanted to be in Google, you're right, but it hit them right between the eyes and mm -hmm. just got them to open to think enough about there must be another way when they realize that all their patients are doing terrible. You know? Yeah. Uh -huh. What a horrible thing to be a doctor whose patients never get better. What a horrible thing to be a bridge builder whose bridges all fell down or a florist who delivered flowers, whose flowers all wilted at the, at the door sill. Can you imagine how horrible it must be to be a doctor? Except for maybe there are some exceptions, orthopedic surgeons, uh, eye doctors. They have these little gimmicks that they can do and, and help people a lot with. But most doctors who are taking care of chronic disease, all doctors who are taking care of chronic disease, uh, I don't know how they go home and look themselves in the mirror. I, I, don't, I don't know how they just don't jump ship. Mm -hmm. You know, just <laughs> jump off the bridge. I can't stand this anymore. Nobody ever gets better. Right. And the, and the reason they don't get better is because they don't deal with the problem. The problem is food poisoning. But a lot of, a lot of new doctors are figuring that out, and they're, they're starting to help their patients. And more than that, the patients are figuring it out, and they're helping themselves. And then they go back to the doctors. And wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> right. It would be nice. <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? Yeah, Wouldn't it be nice if, if we didn't have we didn't have to have people go to jails and lawyers and doctors? I can think of all kinds of horrible places I'd like to not go. <laughs> dentists. I don't want to go to dentists either. Don't go to dentists. <laughs> um, okay, Dr. Franco, let me move to one more question here that a, a mom wrote. And she says that she's a part of a sugar work group in her local elementary school. And let's see here what it says. And the gist of this group is to draw attention to the role of excessive sugar consumption in the uh, in developing uh, diabetes and other chronic diseases and attempting to reverse this trend. She says, we would love to uh, hear what Dr. Mardugo has to say to tackle the problem of excessive sugar consumption in elementary school children. Okay. Well, I, I have to give you two completely separate answers. Okay. Uh, you know, one is uh, you shouldn't have the sugar in the school, in the schools. I mean, in the first place. Right. Yeah, if you shouldn't have my they, there was a time when they had uh, soda machines in the school halls. I think they've gotten rid of, the, of those in most schools. Right. Uh, mothers shouldn't be sending the kids to the school with, uh, with, with candy. I mean, it just shouldn't be allowed. Uh, at the school that my grandchildren go to, those things are not allowed in school. So, period. You've gotten taken care of that. But uh, sugar does not cause diabetes. Mm -hmm. Sugar does not cause heart disease. Sugar does not cause cancer or promote cancer. Sugar rots teeth, raises triglycerides. If you eat enough of it, you can cause nutritional imbalances because it's empty calories. And maybe through that pathway, you can encourage other diseases, but you're going to have to eat you know, a third of your diet or half of your diet is sugar. So get over it. You know, it's just like I told you, like, uh, uh, Gary Taubes and uh, Robert Lustig, you know, complete, you know, they're missing the entire elephant in the room. All they're doing, sugar, 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 sugar. And by the way, both of them, as I say, have generous bellies. Sugar, 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 sugar. And they miss the fact that it's the animal foods and the oils that are sickening the country in the world. Yeah, sh sugar, it's not, it's not to say sugar is a good guy or that we shouldn't limit it drastically but you shouldn't let sugar be the scapegoat for the real problems. And uh, to, get on, to get on my environmental uh, kick, you don't hurt planet Earth at all by growing sugar. In fact, you probably make it better. Right. But by raising cattle, you destroy, you destroy the environment. You don't even make planet Earth bad by growing heroin or cocaine or tobacco but you do buy grown pigs and cows and chickens. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, get things in perspective, ladies and gentlemen. Yes. Right, exactly. Uh, talking about uh, perspectives, I just want to mention that you have written a lot of articles and actually and, and videos that are on your website. And I want to 
remind everybody that if today's webinar has not answered all your questions, they'll probably answer on Dr. Maduro's website. Uh, that's right. Is that correct, Dr. Maduro? You've written. Well, we have. I, I, you, 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 you told me that you and I have been good friends for more than a year, mm -hmm. and we've been knocking out these. Uh, yes. Uh, little little uh, fireside chats here for about uh, maybe a year and a half now. Yeah, so you right. uh, one, one a week. Right. So there's a lot of them, and. Um, Hopefully, it hasn't gotten to the point where I'm getting so repetitive, and I don't think so. No, I don't. I, I, you know, I, I would uh, stop me if I am, but I've been at this for 50 years, and I got so many stories I love to tell you. You know, <laughs> I just have so many. There are some things I have to repeat, but I, there are some places I could go as a doctor and uh, experiences I've had. I think that would really, you, you, I find interesting when I tell them to myself. Right. Maybe that's a sign. Maybe that's a sign of old age and insanity when you start telling your own <laughs> stories. <laughs> that's true, uh, uh, Doctor McDougall. Since diabetes is always a, a hot topic, and we and I had someone write a, a question about this. Uh, this person says, when when a diabetic switches to a starch-based diet, minus oils and animal products, of course, and his right. or her um, lab, uh, sugar levels drop. What is the proper way to stop taking medication? What do you do with your patients? You see that, see that white wastebasket over there? Huh? Oh. You see, you see that wastebasket over there? <laughs> <laughs> what, what I do, what Dr. Lim and I do, and I'll have to tell you, you know, Dr. Lim just started working with me right. a little over a year ago, and it's been an adjustment for him to see a, a, a different way to practice medicine. And he's learned uh, some very interesting lessons. And I've let him learn some of these lessons on his own about not reducing medication quick enough. And uh, he's learned, believe me, he's learned. Uh, what I do with a type two diabetic, who I'm sure is type two, that means you make as much insulin, if not more insulin than somebody who's normal. I will take them off all the diabetic pills and all of their insulin. They could be taking as much as 140 units of insulin, and I will ask him to throw it in the trash that night if I'm sure they're type 2. Now, how do I know they're type 2? Well, they're generally pretty big, pretty pretty overweight. Mm -hmm. uh, their blood sugars uh, are generally not too high. They're, you know, sometimes I even see them in the normal range on all that medication, which is really crazy. But the sugars uh, don't seem that high. They tell me about history of never uh, going into ketoacidosis, uh, nothing suggesting that they ever got sick with serious diabetes, type 1 diabetes. And if they say that, and they're comfortable, you know, I don't, I don't want to scare them, and they're comfortable, I will say, well, why don't we just stop it? Uh, you've got the insulin here. If you need it, you can always take some. We're all going to be here. Everything will be fine. And almost every one of them is thrilled. That's why they came to see us. They want off those drugs. No other drug the doctor will take them off their drugs. And then what we do is we check their blood sugar every morning. And the sugar may go up a little bit. Yeah, a little bit, not much. Uh, the reason I treat people who say they have type 2 diabetes with medication, and the only medicine I use is insulin. It's long-acting insulin called Lantus. That's the only medicine I use. And I use it for three reasons in somebody who believes they're type 2 diabetic. One is if they lose too much weight, and then they're not type 2 diabetic. They're really type one and a half, and they need insulin to keep the weight on. But you see that only after they've lost 50, 100, 150 pounds. So if they lose too much weight, I put them on some insulin because they have to have it to hold on to their body fat. They're really not type two. They have uh, pancreatic insulin insufficiency. And I can kind of guess that. Uh, the mm -hmm. second reason I'll put them on uh, insulin is if they have symptoms of diabetes. Some people will get, I just had a lady that's happened to a couple weeks ago. Uh, she got very thirsty, very dehydrated, and as a result, uh, her sugars were high enough so that she was actually getting a diuresis, losing water, fluid. And so we put her on a little insulin to uh, correct that balance. And then the third reason I put somebody on insulin is if they worry about the numbers. Their mother, their mother-in-law worries about the numbers. Their doctor worries about the numbers. They worry about the numbers. You know. <laughs> I'm an all-around doctor. I take care of all parts of the body, including the emotions and the, and the thinking. And I'm not saying this sarcastically. 
it is sometimes necessary, particularly in the beginning, for people to be on something, on just so they feel they're safe uh, or they're doing something. And once you put them on a needle, even if it doesn't change their blood sugar, that sense of relief. But right. most of the patients I take care of, don't, they don't want to be on the medicine at all. They're thrilled. They don't mind the fact that their blood sugar is up another 50 or 100 points. They know that once they lose that 50, 100, 150 pounds, that their blood sugar is going to be normal and they're going to be in good health. And when you put them on insulin, it slows their weight loss. And once they hear that, that I'm going to be losing weight a lot slower if you put me on insulin, then they really don't want to be on it. Now, mm -hmm. somebody who's type one and a half, in other words, they lose too much weight, they don't make enough insulin, they develop excessive urination, excessive thirst, I'll put them on a little bit of Lantus, maybe 10, 20 units of Lantus. Somebody who is truly type one, they make no or not sufficient amount of insulin. They absolutely have to be on insulin of, of various forms. I, I find Lantus works well. Uh, I, hate, I hate insulin pumps. Might as well tell you that right now. I don't have to go through that too. I haven't had to go through that before, but insulin pumps, these are the pumps that they attach to people where the pump uh, takes the blood sugar and then it, um, it administers a certain amount of insulin to the person. And the person and their spouse and their children and their friends, they spend all day, what's your number? How much insulin did you give yourself? Do you think you got enough? Do you think you're too much? Oh. All day long, it's a whole conversation. And their entire life is taken over by this pump. They've destroyed no it. Yeah. Right. So one of the, and it's hard and it's hard because people like technology. So when they come in and I give them a little grimace about their pump, and I see how they react and see how hard it's going to be to sell to get them off that pump. Uh, I did somebody sometimes take me two or three days, but almost everybody, every one of them, I get them off the pump. And they're so thrilled that they're back on one or two shots of insulin a day. And they can go play golf, they can go out with their friends for dinner. They don't have to spend their whole life looking at numbers and worrying. These pumps are, they're, they're harmful. They're hurtful to people and they cost lots of bucks. Right. That's why they're popular. <laughs> That's why they are. Yeah. Uh, but, but you would say that someone would have to be under medical supervision or, or rather than just throwing their medical, their medicines tonight. What would you like? <laughs> oh yeah, of course they should be on medical. They right. should go. They should, they should go into their doctor and plead with them. Mm -hmm. and get down on their hands and knees. And, <laughs> oh no, no no don't do that. Just go in and ask for an explanation. You know right. why do I have to be on this medication? This is for type two diabetics. These pills are not for type one. Mm -hmm. Can I stop them and see how I'm doing? Uh, can I change my diet and see how I do? Uh, if you're truly a type 1 diabetic, you're not going to get off insulin. Please don't even think about that. Uh, you, you ought to be in a, in, a, in a discussion, a bargaining position with your doctor. You can always take the things that I've written uh, on my website. There's a whole article about the easy treatment of diabetes. Take it in. Tell the doctor, this is the way I would like to be treated. This tells, this explains why aggressive treatment of diabetes kills Patients who are aggressively treated with pills, shots, tests, they have an increased risk of death, sudden death, heart disease, heart death, uh, hypoglycemia, uh, accidents from hypoglycemia. They gain weight. All the papers show horrible harm to patients, and every doctor's known since that, since 19, since 2008 when it was published three times in the New England Journal of Medicine. It had been published three times before that. Every doctor knows that, yet I have not heard of any doctor who's changed their practice. Mm. And so you go in with that paper that I wrote, you say, do you know any studies otherwise, doctor, that uh, show that I should be aggressively treated? And the uh, doctor would say, no. What, what the doctor might say is, look, I really don't have time for this. Well, doc, here's 200 bucks. I want you to go home tonight. There's $200. Could you not take any more than an hour to read this paper? I want you to read this paper and I'll come and talk to you tomorrow. I don't expect you to do nothing for your for no time at all. Here's, here's $200 or here's $500. Read that paper and let's talk about it. Right. It's yeah. and, I'll, and I'll tell you another crazy thing that I got to get into talking about here soon. I still talk to him, uh, in a, talk to him about, about it to my son, Craig McDougall, the young doctor. And Anthony Lynn, 
the young doctor. In fact, we're at this advanced study weekend, we're having five young doctors. We're having Alona Paldi, Matthew Letterman, uh, Anthony Lim, Craig McDougall, and uh, Tom Campbell, uh-huh. Colin Campbell's son. And these five young doctors are going to give five presentations at the advanced study weekend on the 17th of September. And then the fathers, just happens to be fathers, our doctors and nutritionists, the fathers are going to spend an hour grilling these young doctors. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be really fun. But anyway, one of the things I fight with these young doctors about, they're, you know, they're, gonna, they're, not, they're not going to give in to the old man completely is they keep telling me they've got to lower their hemoglobin A1C. It used to be normal. And then when you found that they lowered it to 6%, which is normal, they ended up, ended up killing people. That's what all those papers are about. So they say, we can't lower it to six. So what are we going to lower it to? Well, they come up somewhere between six, between seven and 8%. And I asked them, and of course I go through the scientific literature asking the question too. I asked them, how did you come up with the number seven to eight? They don't know. Oh. And I say, well, why isn't 10% better? Right. Well, it just doesn't sound better. Well, you can't practice medicine that way. You must have some evidence that having a hemoglobin A1C of 8% is better than 10% or 12%. Where's the evidence? Right. And they have none. Yet, doctors, I bet if you go around and survey a thousand doctors, a thousand doctors will tell you, that you have to lower the hemoglobin A1C to seven or ten percent, not six. We know that's dangerous. Some still say six. Some still, but most will say seven and eight percent. And then you ask them, where is one right. shred of evidence that lowering it to seven and eight is better than lowering it to ten? You have none. In fact, I believe it's not. But they still practice that way, and they all believe it, and they all pat themselves on the backs, and the patients suffer the consequences, like increased use of medication and cost of medication, hypoglycemia, uh, you know, all kinds of things. Oh, there, there, there is one, one, one of the, the gold standards out there that needs to be knocked down. Well, Dr. McDougall, this has been a most interesting webinar, as you saw. Uh, <laughs> you, just, you, just, you, just get, you just get me off track. That's what I happens. just get you off. No, but everything you say is interesting and people appreciate it. And I think we'll at some point we'll do a follow up with more questions uh, like this. Um, uh, one more thing I wanted to ask you because uh, mm -hmm. before we quit, is someone was asking for a little clarification about type 1 diabetes. Were you saying that you would get a person off a pump? with type 1 diabetes and just use um, the lentus or what, what were you really yes, saying? Yes. I, 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 the, pump, the pump is a complex machine that destroys people's lives without any improvement in health because you're totally focused on that pump. You live on the pump. Everything you and your wife talk about are about the pump. It destroys your quality of life. Now, you can't take somebody who's on a pump and put them on nothing. They will mm -hmm. die. All right. It must be switched over to another form of insulin, which can be long-acting, ultra-long-acting, short-acting. I happen to like the ultra-long-acting lanticin insulin, and that's usually uh, what I use. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, I, I learned a long time ago, you can't make too big a deal out of this because you cannot make the blood sugars as perfect as you want them to be. You have to be satisfied with... Uh, you know, with reasonable blood sugars. Because you try and make them too good, you make somebody hypoglycemic, they get in a car accident and they kill your passenger in your car. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, you try and make them too high and I don't know. Right. I mean, you just gotta, you gotta, you gotta be satisfied. I tell people try and keep their blood sugars fasting in the morning between 150 and 350. No, no lower than 150 in the morning. And I only want them to check their blood sugar once a day. They want to check them all day long. I say, you've got better things to do. Just check in the morning. And so they check them once in the morning and uh, get it around 150 to 250 during the day. <clears throat> if they're not happy with that, then maybe they can check it twice a day and give them two shots of insulin. But uh, you know, I, I'm, I, I'm a very easy guy to satisfy when it comes to the best interest of my patients. Mm -hmm. 
Can you say just one quick word, because we have to quit, about stevia? Well, we used to use stevia. It's an artificial uh, sugar or sweet tasting stuff, stuff. It's not sugar, it's from a plant. I believe it's called a stevia plant. And we used to use it at the clinic and uh, we stopped using it because people were getting bowel gas, you know, intestinal gas. And so mm -hmm. we just decided not to use it. It never tasted that good anyway. So we tossed it off uh, out maybe a couple of years after we started using it. I, I think it'd be okay. Uh, there are side effects to it, like intestinal gas. Right. And you might as well use the real stuff. You know, you're mm -hmm. talking about six, 16 calories of sugar on your oatmeal. Right, right. Yeah. Okay, all right. Well, thank you. We have a really fun webinar planned for next week. Do you want to tell people what it's going to be about? Oh, uh, this is the one where we are going to talk about, uh, I'm not going to be involved. <laughs> no, you really, won't. Really, I won't be involved. Uh, this is the one where Mary and Heather, my wife and daughter, and two other professional chefs, cooks. Uh, you can introduce their names if you want, Gustavo, because I got too quick of a look at it. Uh, four, 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 the other thing there is they're four mothers. Right. And what they're going to do is talk to you about school lunches. But this could just as apply as well to your spouse's lunch. Exactly. You know? But they're going to be, but they're, 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 their point of view is from the point of view of mothers. Uh, but uh, the same will apply for anybody you're packing a lunch mm -hmm. for yourself, packing a lunch for yourself, packing a lunch for any uh, friend or family member. But uh, specifically, the, the conversation will will be uh, about uh, about their children, what they've learned. Now, Mary goes back. Oh yeah, her, her forty-two years. I think forty-two years. Yeah. Wow. Well, well yeah, we will have we will have fun. We will miss you, but we'll have <laughs> about six people here. Uh, I'll, I'll be sitting in the background laughing. Okay. <laughs> you can see me struggle in uh, trying to keep those these keep. six arms to, you know. Uh, yeah, and, and make sure they don't make any mistakes now, Gustavo. Don't don't to make sure they don't throw in a little, you know, just a small piece of salmon. Right, right. No way. Yeah. Well, very good. Thank you again, Dr. McDougall. And um, okay. so we will see you in two weeks then. And, um, yes. And everybody can sign up for these webinars for free on your website at drmazuga.com. They just yeah, we'll show up. Can we take a minute to tell them? Because most of them already know, but just briefly let you know we're starting a program tomorrow, too late, right. probably. And we have the advanced study weekend. And I told you about the young guests that are going to be there. They're also going to be Brendan Davis and uh, Dean Arnish and uh, Susan Roberts and uh, Robert uh, uh, Mardola and uh, uh, just a lot of really, really great people. Uh, T. Colin Campbell is going to be there also, but not in a speaking capacity, but you'll get to some time to sp uh, spend with uh, Karen and T. Colin Campbell. They'll be there too. I'll be giving a couple of talks. So we're doing that on the 16th of uh, September. You don't want to miss this. This is the advanced study weekend. Wild things happen there, and Gustavo is going to be there. And then we're running professional programs. Uh, we're running programs for companies the rest of the fall. And then our next open public program, 10-day program, will be uh, December of 2016. And I believe we're doing one in January, and then we're going to uh, Kauai, at the end of January, 2017. So the end of January, you can join us and, and Gustavo's going to Kauai with us also. Uh, that'll be a great trip. Uh, we've got a good number of people, very few rooms left. So if you wanna go, now's the time to, to sign up. And uh, that's what we're doing. Very good. Now, uh, were you going to do something now? Did you tell me you were gonna do something now? Yeah, I, yesterday, I, uh, you know, I usually get my, uh, your newsletters and I usually cook something that some of your uh, wife's uh, recipes there, Mary's. And so yesterday I made something and I thought I would share with people. It's very short because uh, people keep asking about just uh, what, what okay. we eat. So I'm gonna do a little demo, five, five minutes maybe. All right, so we're back on here. Welcome to my little kitchen here. And um, what I'm going to do is basically I wanted to 
just show you something really short. I print the newsletters every month, and this is the newsletter from Dr. Mathugal's website that is from the month of May. So um, I found uh, this recipe that is sloppy lentils too. It's almost on, at the last page here. And it's so simple. So I'm not going to cook it for you because I already did it, but I'm going to show you what I, how I, how I prepared, uh, how I eat it basically, and how I ate it yesterday and today. Uh, it's very simple. So you see that big pot over there? That's the pot where I put four cups of water and I put two cups of dried lentils in it. And then I chopped one large onion, one green pepper, and one carrot. And that's it. So you put it there and it boils for 30 minutes. And after 30 minutes, you add the rest of the ingredients, which is four cups of tomato sauce. And then I put one tablespoon of soy sauce, one tablespoon of parsley flakes, and one bay leaf. And then you had half teaspoon basil and one fourth teaspoon of garlic powder. And all that is in the newsletter. So I would recommend that if you like this, that you go and you print it, or if you want to save paper, you watch, you, you know, you read it from your tablet or computer. And it boils for another 30 minutes. So the whole thing, it takes an hour. And while that's going on, I just do stuff at home or read or answer emails or whatever. And in an hour, it's, it's done. And it smells great. It's really delicious. And it smells wonderful. You can see the, the lentils and the carrots and the onions and the green peppers and all the great stuff. I mean, yesterday, what I did is this. At lunch, I ate a bowl this big, probably a little bigger, and I steamed some broccoli, which I have here. And um, I don't worry about how much I eat. I just eat until I'm satisfied, because I know that if I'm hungry later on, I can have some more, I can have something else, or have a, a sweet potato or a baked potato. So yesterday for lunch, it was the lentil, uh, basically stew, and my um, broccoli. The broccoli, I love it with just um, a little bit of salt and pepper, but if you don't want to use salt, I sometimes just put lemon juice, and that's fine, and then it just tastes great. So what am I going to do today, because... It's 2 p.m. to 15 here in Texas, in Dallas, so I'm <laughs> hungry. And I'm going to eat it the way it's in the newsletter, which is um, as a sandwich. So I went to a local bakery here, and I got some uh, whole wheat burger buns, and I'm toasting them right there in the oven. And I will put some fresh tomatoes, onions, and... Um, I make my own hummus, and this is red, uh, roasted red pepper hummus, and I make tons of it because I use it as a spread instead of, let's say, mayonnaise, and I use it for dipping vegetables. I use it for just about everything. So this is hummus, and I'm going to spread the hummus on the hummer, on the burger buns. Let me see if they're ready. So, they are, and they're hot. So, what I'm going to do is spread, sorry, I'm going to spread some of my roasted red pepper hummus on this toasty bun here, and I will put the lentils on top of that. And I could make a sandwich and put the tomatoes and the onions and then just put this on top. But today, I'm just going to um, basically eat them naked like that on top without, without a bun on the top. I'll just eat each one individually. That way I can have more of this wonderful stuff here, of the lentils. And so that's what I'm doing. And I just wanted to show you how simple it is. It doesn't, I'm gonna put one or two slices 
of tomatoes, some onions. I don't have to talk to anybody in, in, a, in close proximity today, <laughs> so I can put onions on it. And of course, if you like, you can even use ketchup. I try to use, to buy the organic ketchup that doesn't uh, have added sugar. You can use uh, salsa, or you can use um, like um, barbecue sauce. So, but I'm kind of a plain, you know, eater. So I just put the hummus. The hummus is what I really like. So this is my lunch. And then I have a couple of baked potatoes that I'm going to bake for later on in the afternoon if I get hungry. And then tonight I'm just making two or three potatoes that I cut and I boil uh, for a few minutes. And then I'm I put some spices and I throw them in the oven and I will probably have either broccoli or uh, saute spinach with garlic. Of course, saute with water, not, not with oil. And that's the plan for today. Thank you for sticking for a few more minutes to, um, to watch this. And um, whenever I have a little more time, I will do an actual cooking demonstration for you all. Thank you again and we'll see you next week with, uh, with Mary McDougall, Heather McDougall, and three or four other uh, moms that will be guests, and we will talk about school lunches for kids. But as Dr. McDougall said, they can be school lunches for us or other people in our family. Have a great day. Bye-bye, everyone.